everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to usher you into the day. It is March 11th. A lot of stuff has been going on. Montana in March has always has been one of the one final winter hurrah, which most meteorologists, you know, were kind of mentioning this week that there was supposed to be like single digits, which we did get on Thursday, but it wasn't as low as many people were uh, fearing and predicting. Some people were saying it was like, oh, you know, we're going to have at least like one degrees and then a minus. But that didn't really happen, especially as we got into Thursday afternoon where we started seeing things start warming up more and more. I'm not saying that winter is officially over because we always have some kind of cold spell every single month leading into the summer. So expect to look out for some of those moving forward as well. But according to the weather for Thursday, it was about seven degrees down in the valley with some wind. And uh, but the afternoon was pretty much hotter than expected. Uh, now we can expect to see uh, weather going into the 50 degrees, maybe even touching uh, 60 degrees this weekend, but pretty much marking the end of winter in Missoula officially before a, of course, random winter spell that's going to be happening. All right, let's talk about the biggest news that's happening in, in and around the world. It's Ukraine. The biggest fear on many minds is the potential for biological warfare. And so far, the Kremlin and Putin and their officials blame that the U.S. is uh, arming Ukraine with biological weapons and so far. But U.S. officials uh, scoffed that off and said that this is an excuse for Russia to use biological weapons themselves. So there's a big uh, ongoing fear about that. Uh, so, so far, Wednesday marks the two weeks uh, in, uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, this war primarily, most likely, will probably go on for quite some time. It's not going to be ended uh, as soon. A lot of uh, Putin and the Kremlin and the war chest uh, have been built up uh, certain things within their country to cover that. But with sanctions and more economic things, uh, making it harder for most uh, Russians in the in in of Russia to be able to access accounts and their own money, uh, there's going to be a lot more pressure put on them as well. But then again, they can't speak out against their government because uh, there's a 10 to 15 year uh, for spreading misinformation, fake news, which was coined here in the United States. Primarily, the main focus of all European countries have been in favor of Russia turning around and leaving Ukraine just outright. Uh, having not heard that the countries would reverse sanctions after the fact, perhaps emphasizing that the EU and the West are willing to work with Russia if they do tur uh, turn tail back, uh, maybe that could be an option, but then at the same time, those options have not been presented, uh, or uh, I haven't heard about it in mainstream media. So far, the Russians have limited international sites like BBC Russia from uh, conveying the I international viewpoints of what's going down in Russia. Recently, Russia has cracked down on the Russian protesters with a maximum sentence of 10 to 15 years, which went through their uh, official part uh, the Kremlin and all that information are on their they voted on it to make it official pretty much right away. So they can pretty much do anything that they want. Uh, they had uh, OVD Info, an independent monitoring group that tracks detentions in Russia, says over 7,500 people have been arrested in anti-war protests over the past week. And this was from Friday, so who knows how many more people have done that as well. Russia, in terms of just like being in contact with most people, has been pretty much cut off. Uh, then again, you got to understand that there's still a lot of uh, a potential for uh, communication through cell phones and more. Uh, many people are many people who have family in Ukraine, also in Russia, because they're very close and they were part of the same Soviet Union at, so on, at some point. So there's a lot of families being kind of uh, it's it's very much like talking to those relatives here at home, being like, "Have you not been watching the news? Have you not been paying attention?" Uh, to what's been going on. It's kind of like very much like that with uh, some of the families that they have back in Russia. So there's just def definitely a lot of gaslighting going on. It's, it's very weird, it's, uh, but at the same time, it's not too surprising. But over the weekend uh, past, the 1.5, act actually it's like way more than like 1.7 million people uh, left and fled Ukraine with uh, 16, to, uh, so all men 16 to 60 were asked to stay behind and fight or give themselves to, de to defend their country. The no-fly zone debate has been raging on. A lot of uh, populist media have been saying that, oh, we got to do no-fly zone, we got to do no-fly zone, which would put America at with direct uh, with w America, NATO, EU with direct conflict with Russia, making this isolated Ukraine conflict into a much bigger war. Although. Uh, one other note to mention as well is that all these economic sanctions, according to Putin, have uh, to him says that, that that is akin to an act of war. And of course, although we may not be war with Russia, according to him, those sanctions are akin to war. So America doesn't seem to have the boots on the ground, but they have been uh, mobilizing and working with other countries from getting involved with this conflict is important. Um, and so far, Biden has been very reluctant to get any kind of American boots in Ukraine. But so far, it seems like there's some reports of uh, mobilization and a lot of uh, 
militaries kind of building up. And then there's the whole deal with the whole Polish jets being uh, sent to Ukraine. But there's just a lot of things that's like you're, you're sending people planes in an active war zone. And I, there's no guarantee that there's a Ukrainian military that would know how to fly some of those planes. So there's some logic behind that that's kind of weird. But let's talk about the things that are affecting us here in America, and that's gas prices. So gas prices are putting the hurt on us. Many media outlets are saying, it's like, oh, you're doing this for America. It's like, no, not necessarily, because if you look at it like with the numbers, I just crunched the numbers a little bit. Last week, we pretty much had 3.55 a gallon, which, uh, and then we wanted to basically ban all foreign import of oil from. Russia, which basically told us about 7% of our imports internationally. So we, you'd think that uh, uh, $3.55 times 7%, which equals uh, 24 cents, so that would be 24 more cents a gallon, at putting it at 3.79 for gas. But that hasn't necessarily happened in most communities, especially Missoula, seeing numbers uh, t reaching an average of $4 per gallon. So within a week, we've basically both been um, uh, uh, dealing with the economic repercussions of our actions against Russia and at the same time price gouging from the bigger companies seeing if they can get away with it. So my impression of big oil is kind of feels like at one point it's um, <laughs> it's like oh there's something bad happening let's raise the gas prices oh there's something else happening uh, that doesn't really affect us. We could just raise the gas prices because it's such in the media and the news today. So it's, it's, it, the message is clear. No one wants to do business with countries invading other countries. That seems to be the case, uh, but we still have to uh, 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 think about our own hypocrisy when it comes to that, because U.S., it was clear that we invaded Iraq without any merit. It, it was confirmed, and our Afghanistan occupation turned into an abjunct failure after we defeated many terrorist cells within the first couple of years. I don't want to get into this debate. There's a lot to it as well, but it's at the end, it's a lot of things were just not worth it. And speaking of things that weren't unfortunately worth it, Bill Cosby. One of the big th news that are happening uh, during this whole craziness is that Bill Cosby was released. Uh, and uh, later on, they were looking to get that reversed and get him back in prison. And of course, that did not, uh, that failed on the higher courts and the Supreme Court. Um, so for those of you who remember, America's former dad, Bill Cosby, came under fire when a group of women came forward about a sexual assault on multiple occasions with a theme of roofies and false promises to forward some of their careers. During the 2006 disposition, uh, deposition, sorry, uh, seemingly freewheeling, Cosby gave a long stream of consciousness answers to questions from uh, uh, the uh, Andrea Costanz lawyer. She was the only one that uh, came forward and had her name out there in the media. Uh, he detailed his sexual involvement with a string of young women, a very s a few still in their teens over the years, and recalled giving several of them, including Andrea Costand, alcohol or pills while he remained sober. So uh, unfortunately, that was not admissible in court, and they were uh, unable to do that. But they were able to get some kind of conviction with that, but eventually got overturned while he was in prison. Uh, and he got off on a technicality and the 12-year statute of limitation and also in Philadelphia law. So scores of women have come forward to say Cosby has sexually assaulted them, but Andrea Costanz is the only one to uh, the, that ones has been released their name. The other ones have been, uh, haven't released their name for privacy. Um, his insurer against Cosby's wishes settled a Man Massachusetts lawsuit involving seven accusers for undisclosed amount after the 2018 conviction. At least two other lawsuits remain pending against the actor. Many women have been reluctant to take on a man who is once considered untouchable, and now the legally blind 84-year-old will, uh, will consider returning to stand-up. So that's something that's going on in our world today. But let's talk about what's happening in our corner here in Missoula. Missoula County established Missoula Aging Service in 1982 and has seen the population of older adults increase exponentially since. The population of senior adults in the county grew 40% between 2010 and 2019, while the population of those aged 74 and older grew by 22%. So there's a huge percentage of, of adults who have aged up, and uh, Missoula Aging Services is a staple of Missoula, making it easier for seniors to get services and help for an ever-changing world in the, the digital divide and updating healthcare plans and more even going so far as to giving seniors a purpose in helping youth of the nation and help folks by delivering meals with gra gas reimbursement, reimbursement, sorry. And of course, I did a short piece on Tuesday as uh, Missoula is starting to grow in terms of retired and aging individuals utilizing this particular service, um, Meals on Wheels, and this marks the, uh, I believe it's the 50th anniversary of a nutrition act. But without further ado, I have a, 
a short piece to provide for you guys. It's about eight minutes long, and when I come back, we're going to talk about some movies that are coming out. So here is March for, for, March for Meals 2022. Oh, that's the wrong one. This is the right one. from someone, whether it be the doctor or it could be the hospital, social worker, and we call and talk to them, get information about their, you know, why they're homebound and what we can do to help, how many meals they might need, and then we just kind of move from there. And we usually, if it's early in the day when we get the call, we can start them the very next day. So, I don't know if they said that we could go in there or not, but um, this is Lindy. She's the one who does all the packaging of our meals and serves them up. And, hey, smile. <laughs> they do a lot of meals every day, so. Today we're doing 310 hots. And I do the bags upstairs that have the desserts and the frozen meals in them. I did 344 bags of frozen dessert fruit meals this morning. Wow. Starting at, I was here at 335. So have you been here for a long time? Going on. Oh, two years. Wow, so have you seen this study increase during the pandemic? I can, I can barely keep up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we're serving today is sweet and sour chicken with rice and broccoli and brown rice, and some is white rice. Um, I'm also serving beef patties with brown gravy with rice. Um, that is for my people that don't, do not like chicken. I start at four in the morning and my day ends Anytime after one. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of the way. Well, uh, this is, I can't I'm not sure if you're going to You all right? Yeah, well, I would love to. I want to do the meat to meat. We have Route 9, which is a route near the good food store oh, in that good. area. We have usually between 16 and 19 clients. Deliver to. Takes us a couple hours. Okay. Do you know, like, uh, like, I guess with all the travel, do you probably know all the shortcuts in that particular area and everything? Actually, they have a pretty good mapping system that they give us, and they put the, uh, the clients in order, and so we just look at the manifest, make sure we've got enough milk, whole milk, make sure we have enough skim milk, <laughs> make sure we have enough hot meals, and then be sure that we count the bags so that we have everybody. So. Nice. Like how uh, the Meals and Wheels program have changed in the last just two years. Well, we, well, we used to have recycled bags to give to people with all their meals. And then they'd, they'd leave their used bags and we'd pick them up and bring them back. But as soon as the pandemic started, we switched to paper bags that were disposable. We all. can't go into the people's houses, homes at all. We have to stay outside. So if they have any conversations, and we always do, okay, it's, we're, you know, six feet away, they're standing in their door, and I'm standing in the snow. <laughs> I was asked to do some Zoom thing on Thursday, but I can't do that. I've been at the agency almost 39 years, and I'm close to retiring, and it has been an honor and a privilege to work with older adults. Throughout my professional career, I started and was interested in it because of the greatest generation, the post World War II, and have um, now we're seeing the Vietnam era people, and so, um, and some of the Gulf War people. And so I look at it from wars, and each one are very different in terms of generational and how they look at things and what their needs are. Meals on Wheels is very critical for people to be able to stay and age in place. It provides good nutrition 
it's not their sole source, but it's a good hot meal, and better yet, it is a check-in every day by one of our dedicated volunteers. It's a life-saving measure. I mean, it's like, we're kind of like the last line of defense, because you get some people, even though their relatives check on them, or family and friends, some of them are just so, they isolate themselves so much. But for some reason, you bring them a hot meal, they're gonna open that door, they're gonna say, hey, hi, or they're gonna say, you know what, I don't feel well today. And then, so that starts a process of hoping, you know, so, so nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And they may, they may have, uh, you know, ambulatory issues that, you know, they can't get to the door as quickly as we deliver. But, you know, some people just don't come to the door. Other people open up the door, there's the dog, okay. <laughs> they want to like, visit. They, they, they want to visit, them. so Lance goes down the road, he walks down the road and he does a few deliveries while I visit with one person, and so they're... They're quite a, quite a great group of people. We do need more volunteers. We've increased by such a significant amount that we need to break our routes up and add a couple, of, at least one route. And so we're going to need some more drivers that can cover routes for us. That's, that's a big thing. So. And Montana in general is uh, one of the oldest states uh, per capita in, um, in our country. And we want to be able to serve everybody who comes, for example, in Meals and Wheels. Um, we have to raise at least 200000 every year, and that goes up from the community, and that's what Marsha for Meals is about, raising the awareness of the program, because we want to serve everybody who's eligible. There's one guy I love delivering to me, because he's so sincere, he just goes, oh, you're a star. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, hey, I'm a star today. So it's, it's very fulfilling. Because I came from the for-profit world to the non-profit world, um, but it's very, very rewarding. And I gotta say, it was a little shocking to me that how much we depend on vol volunteers to make this program work. Like if we didn't have them, it wouldn't be there. So it's, they are so, so important. It's a big deal. Uh, and I think one part is that we work hard on our culture of our organization. We're nothing without our staff. We can't do services or our volunteers. And uh, we feel strongly, we have strong orientation programs. Um, I come from the Midwest, so I like to say we hire the cream of the crop. Thank you, Scott. What was your first name? Scott. Scott. Nice to meet He's you. He's an MCAT. Yeah. And he hung out with us for, he's tolerated our mission for years. I love it. They, you guys almost uh, can memorize it. Yeah. yeah. Promote the independent dignity and health of older adults and those that care for them is never changed. Uh, it's just we change to adapt to whatever is needed. And we often are serving people in multiple generations uh, within the generation. So we might be serving somebody in their 90s and their adult child is 70. And uh, that's the, that's the uh, impact of longevity these days where we're seeing multiple uh, generations within that 60 and older. People are living longer and they're being healthier and we're here to help them on that journey. Hi guys, welcome back. So I wanted to also remind you guys as well, it is March for Meals, it is their annual giving campaign and it's expected by 2030, more than 22% of Montana's population will be 60 years or older. Uh, overall, the Asian Service is looking to get funding for their uh, this growing nonprofit and they want to introduce four new mills to replace the current two mills, which is uh, uh, an annual $350,000 budget and they're looking to increase it to uh, 500,000, half a million dollars a year, uh, every year. Um, so your cost will be uh, $16.20 a year per home, making it about $1.54 a month for this new mill and it's going to be put on the ballot for you guys to uh, elect on, to uh, vote on, to elect on. All right, so let's talk about some movies that are coming up. Uh, it's time for Pre-Critic, where I pre-judge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my pre-judgment uh, on most movies that are coming out. This is one of those kind of uh, inspirational uh, sports kind of uh, uh, rising against the odds and all stuff like that. It's called Tyson's Run. I think it's about a cultural divide between blur that being blurred through the power of running. An unathletic boy with autism strives to become an unlikely marathon champion, giving his f uh, unfulfilled uh, father 
purpose, and a second chance at putting his family first. This, uh, that's the synopsis, and I think it's uh, that this kid is dealing with some real issues while trying to get over uh, his own wall that runners hit, uh, metaphorically. Uh, but he will once, uh, but he won't, but he won't once he gets hit to the marathon to win the whole thing. I don't know, something tells me this movie will halt barn. He's just like us. And the trend that the Hollywood uh, tends to nail in our cultural zeitgeist for people who we should just treat equally regardless. Um, off season, horror movie in March about woman trapped in a sketchy town that holds the truth to her past but ends up getting in over her head. It's very much like Silent Hill. Anyways, this movie has it all. Old man warning her and plenty of let's go. Oh God, we cannot leave. Deals with the devil and now you uh, got a town of a southern accent. Hicks coming for ya. Uh, at this uh, point, horror movies that have southern accents uh, automatically means a society has broken down to its based reasoning. Uh, you better not do the thing that will get you there because you'll never leave. And luckily for this pre-critic segment, it ends. Um, moving on, we got Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Dawn of Ragnarok. This is a DLC, so when games are released unfinished and they say, it's like, hey, this is a great game, you should play this game. Um, and then you're just like, okay, I already played the game. It's like, well, well, here's some more game of the game that you have been playing to uh, supplement you playing more of the same game, but you have to pay $20 more to keep playing the same game you already own. Makes sense, right? So anyways, Assassin's Creed has a very pretty much a copy and paste when it comes to their games. They just change their looks and they'd be like, oh, so this is in um, Norse mythology. And then they have another one. Oh, this is a Roman Empire. You're a... Uh, you're a Spartan, yeah, Spartan. And what about another one? Uh, you're you're in France and you're an assassin. It was like, what about Americans? Like, we gotta we gotta cover the American experience. So let's do an American. Oh, you get to assassinate for George Washington. Cool. Uh, there's Assassin's Creed for you. So which brings me to my next game, the Countdown to Kirby. Uh, perhaps the most important game of this generation. I'm calling it Game of the Year right now, 2022, people. You're not the only one getting a copy to involve your powers, but you get to envelop cars and vending machines to use their power to your advantage. Uh, we are two weeks away from this game that will kiss you goodnight when you least expect it and cure all the disease and bring back the dead. Uh, but buy this game and you will get another Mario 3D World ripoff and not uh, play Elden Ring or Assassin's Creed, just throw away your Xbox and PlayStation now. Nintendo is one, I'm naming it. Uh, but then again, movies <laughs> that release <laughs> their opening to their movie is very presumptuous. Uh, up next, we don't have a dubbing stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. But we do have a Dude I Just Drew highlight. So this is featuring Mod, who we had on um, uh, our kind of like our... Lake Missoula behind the scenes of Rowan's uh, First Friday art gathering. And so we officially had her on our show. So without further ado, here is the highlights of the highlights of Do It I Just Drew season two, episode 11. Yeah, we're like 30 plus episodes deep into this series. So you guys want to check it out, just go to YouTube. What? Whoa, <laughs> welcome to another episode. Do It I Just Drew season two, with a very special guest. Mod. Mod. And, um, yep, I said it, there we go. Uh, <laughs> let's, what are we doing today? We're gonna be drawing. Uh, I've said it now, five, five minutes to draw. Let's, let's do it, I don't know, I don't have a coin. A cube that makes people uncomfortable. An uncomfortable cube. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, this is a horrible eraser. Take it off. Horrible. They might all be. I think they're all horrible erasers. That just adds. Draw wise. Them. Draw wisely then. Yeah. What do I know about cubes? What do I know about cubes? What don't I know about cubes? <laughs> 
Uh, there. there. <laughs> you have a, you have a, no way, triangle. S slash it sideways. Turn into a little hat. Come on, Alice. I don't know why I said that, but that's cool. <laughs> oh God, it's a cursed eraser. Comfortable Cube. because the eraser is now a shader. You are shading. It is. That's what makes it cool. Yeah. All right. What um, makes you uncomfortable? So, I was just kind of going with like my body horror stuff that I like to do because I don't know. It's, sometimes it's very cursed. <laughs> Le pencil, right here. Can you really pull a pencil and charge on? What? A letter. That. Put in a laugh track if anybody heard Graham's joke. Put in that big old laugh track where they're like laughing and like. You got me, dude. Like, I minute. assure you, it is a, it is a, a cube. It's completely intentional that I do it like that. Uh, cubes are neat, right? They're they're cool and neat and like interesting. And they got, you know, they they got all those sides. They're, I mean, pyramids are a little bit more like popular than than cubes, but like if you look at the bottom of a pyramid, what do you see there? Square. It's square. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't like the way I stopped that. That was a little scary. <laughs> that was a little. That was a bit. That was a little. Don't worry about. That was a little malicious. Swear. I'm sorry. A human with limbs reversed. Okay. Limbs reversed. Okay, so leg, leg, leg goes here. Somebody asked for this. <laughs> somebody, somebody asked asked me to be this way. Little critter, wow. little critter man with fur. You're not if I'm reincarnated, if I'm ever reincarnated, I hope I don't end up like that. Oh gosh, if I didn't even think about that. Actually, actually exists. I'm sorry, other people who watch the show. Whoa, is it? Um, or isn't it? <laughs> Ow, my leg! Ah, this chair. Ruin <laughs> this chair. Hashtag, hashtag relatable. Ow! <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. No, leave him. Put a filter on him. <laughs> it's not real. Thanks, Thanks future Graham. It's problematic. <laughs> Why is this it problematic? This is a problematic. Why is it problematic? This is a problematic. Jeanette Rancor. Yeah. Jeanette? Could you mix Jeanette Rankin with a Rancor? I don't even know what Jeanette Rankin looks like. <laughs> Scott broke the one rule. No, that's, that's all I have to say. Listen, you're just going to get Jabba the Hutt in a dress. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then he dunked his hand in the little little fishbowl thing. He's like, and he's like, ow. Let's see, I ate a goldfish. <laughs> this is it. This is why I'm charging in, Peach. Star Wars. Look, Star Wars Rancor. Look, wow, wow. Right, guys. <laughs> A living failure. <laughs> A living failure. I see that. Well, I see me right there. Look, it's me. <laughs> it just when I thought about that, I kind of thought about Frankenstein's monster. Of course, of course you go for that. Of course. Oh, of course. Thanks, Graham. Thanks. Living failure. Wow. So destitute. So broken. So sad. He has a nice coat. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right. I can't wait. Um. It is the beginning of an epic failure. IRL. Yes. So I am drawing the most painful feeling ever. Like it's anything? just the sadness of dropping any juice or milk and it's it just like explodes and it splashes all over your feet and like oh, no. so like if you have it like really bad like um mm. at walmart you know the little spindly things like one of those went flying somebody had like set it there and it just catapulted across like walmart and then it just like exploded milk and it was just Ooh. like what do you even do fungus people from pluto oh. Okay. okay, that's palatable. I love, I love the mushrooms on my pizza. I love the pizza. <laughs> Mario, <laughs> is that you, Mario? Pluto person, little pee pee. <laughs> Did you just say pee pee? Thanks. Oh no, oh, that's no. on the wrong side. I was distracted. Oh, yeah. oh <laughs> no! What a fatality. <laughs> Two, okay. yeah. two push-ups, ready, okay. You need to do, you do more? push-ups every single time you hear One, yourself like that. Two, three, four, five, okay. All right, okay. Oh,
Oh, bummer. That looks awesome. I got distracted. I wish I could. I wish I could draw for the. Oh, you need to get out of here. Save me! Why am I here? Oh, nice. he's so cold. Tell the legend of Mushroom Man. Uh, there once was a Mushroom Man that lived up in Kalo. <laughs> Look! Wow. Mushroom! <laughs> That's pretty good. That's an old paint. Another great episode! We had some pretty uh, cool art. I almost said epic. That, that wasn't bad. Um, <laughs> That's some pretty cool art. Thank you for coming on to the show. As always, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Spreadshirt. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to look for my stuff, you can look me up on Instagram and Uh No more exclamation mark on Twitter. You can check out my comic on Punch Drunk on Shrine Comics if you want to. It's cool. If you want to, it'd be cool to me. Also, comment what, uh, comment any drawing suggestion you want. Yeah, if you want to. Yeah, leave a comment. You have any social media you want? A shout out. Um, I don't remember my URL. So. Okay. My Instagram one. It's like modlin underscore art. Go check it out. It's modlin art. Check it out on Instagram. Anyways, fun episode. Good episode. Good art. And uh, yeah, check us out in the next episode. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back. We're diving right into it. I want to go back to. Uh, uh, March for Meals because uh, th that's their month-long fundraiser and they're always looking for more money because they're uh, expanding exponentially in terms of delivery and clients needing uh, those fresh and nutritious meals for people who are homebound, uh, many of which are in rural areas of Missoula County who have been receiving daily meals and special Friday meals to carry over through the weekend. Uh, the City of Missoula Day gave a proclamation and anyone on a fixed budget, budget and are able to apply, go to MissoulaAsianServices.org for more information you can call them at 728-7682 with the 406 prefix, prefix it's 728-7682 uh, for more information on how you apply I don't know if I use the word prefix correctly anyways but if you want to get access to cheap food uh, regardless of economic status you could go through the Missoula Food Bank they have their regular daily hours all week long and there's a great way for you to just go there based no bias, no economic status, just go there, you can get some cheap food. Um, Missoula Food Bank, they're open daily uh, off of Wyoming Street, you can't miss them. All right, so this meeting was fairly short for the City Council and only had two items on the consent agenda, but I'm going to dive into public comment a little bit more because there's a lot of public comment going on here as well. And I wanted to kind of bring this one particularly up. I usually, um, um, this one is very interesting because one of the public comments were uh, personally attacking uh, somebody at the University of Montana, and so the City Council uh, had to do a point of order against him, and this is Max Larson. I just wanted to remind the public that last month we were told uh, that we'd be returning to in in person meetings for the city council, um, and we're we're still not there. Two years into this, um, and you know I'm very thankful for the headers on all of the agendas that have the join meeting link. Um, fought very hard to get that link on there, and uh, it it seems to be useful now. Um, <clears throat> just also wanted to talk about uh, the uh, university a little bit and. Uh, a professor by the name of Clayton Looney. Um, if you haven't checked it out yet, check it out on Instagram, fire underscore Clayton underscore Looney. Um, this is regarding Clayton Looney's public statement. I think point of order. And using the point N word. Of order, Mr. Mayor, I think this is bordering on a personal issue. And point of order, Gwen, can, uh, here? let me talk, please. Thank you. Point of order, we don't have anything to do with the university. Point of order, this is general commentary. On matters having to do with the city. This is where the university is located. All right, so that's when they just cut them off right then and there. I have a couple notes. I just kind of want to leave it right there. Interpret it how you want. I think it's important to leave it there and move on. Um, Aaron Heaton talks about uh, black, indigenous, and people of color uh, give uh, to give in a lot of the same resources on the uh, city's website as the LGBTQ community. And this is uh, Aaron talking a little bit more about that. I noticed that on the city council homepage, there's a tab for LGBTQ plus info and resources. This is absolutely crucial to supporting and advocating for queer Missoulians. 
I believe the same decency should be extended to other minority groups. I recommend that the City Council homepage add a tab for BIPOC info and resources. The information in this tab can include the same ordinance given under the LGBTQ plus tab and the same anti-bias links. It can also include resources that are unique to the BIPOC experience. Last week, the mayor stressed the importance of black history in the Missoula community. The city council ought to respect this proclamation by providing support for BIPOC Missoulians. Okay, so that was uh, Aaron talking a little bit more about that. And I think it is important to kind of, uh, you know, it's the city doesn't know everything and they need uh, public comment to be like, hey, you know, you guys should add this to your thing. And then hopefully you can get the ball rolling on that regard. Um, a lot of times people complain to the city and about certain places and certain ideas and most of the people have never heard of those ideas so just kind of uh, inform your city council through public comment as well and it, it is a great public comment just to kind of inform people about just kind of what's going on that ne wouldn't necessarily fall within their purview most of the time but Brick Haverstick uh, with Bear Smart is talking about a grizzly bear sow and her cubs coming out of hibernation is worried about the animal uh, who uh, has chosen the Missoula area as their kind of uh, defunct home, and this is what he had to say. Um, what I've learned in doing research on the Bear Smart program, and some of you um, might be in agreement, um, it seems like the two big keys to a successful Bear Smart program are education and enforcement. Um, and, and I'd also like to encourage City Council to seek funding sources to help costs associated with said education and enforcement parts of the Bear Smart program. And I know you, I think you've been hearing a lot about this and I've also been following it. And the great thing is, is we're not alone. Um, others in our region <laughs> have been successful and are, are implementing it. And last but not least, uh, we could use this opportunity to also partner with the university as well as our public school system and take a proactive approach to save the lives of as many bears as we can all right, so uh, one of the things is that uh, this was also in a, an article on the Missoula Current. The bears on the north side were confirmed by wildlife expert Jamie Jonkel and has already developed bad habits, but not to the point where they've had to put it down. In many cases, uh, bears that become too domesticated or too close to society, they usually get dropped off uh, miles away uh, from, um, from towns. And then if they return, th it's like a three strike, they're out and they just euthanize them altogether. So this is very uh, precarious because this uh, mother has two cubs and they wanna make sure that this bear remains wild and the species is thriving. Moving on to the consent agenda, which focused on the fire department looking to sell old equipment and updating the fire department equipment is very expensive, but at the same time tends to be used way past its factory life. Compared to other budgets within the city, the fire department also goes on the most EMT trained calls. Uh, there are a lot of EMT uh, trained folks within the fire department. They're looking to expand that and also they're putting on a lot of the work when it comes to the crisis management for folks in the um, the uh, the crisis uh, mobile unit that was established just about a year ago. And of course, another item, it was Rogers Security, which was hired for the maintaining order through the POV and many of their extension locations. And the household West Side neighborhood is concerned about the uh, potential uh, um, militarization of our security. I'm concerned about $30,000 uh, for a two week looks like a two week period to a security agency that is um, appears to be heavily armed. Um, every time I've seen them, I've been meaning to ask y'all about them for some time now, whether outside the Sleepy Inn or across the street from my home, uh, which is on the west side uh, near Lowell Elementary School. This happened uh, not two weeks ago. There were four, what appeared to be four gentlemen uh, dressed in Rogers International, uh, security um, uniforms carrying uh, what were what appeared to be I don't know anything about weapons but what appeared to be very large um, weapons I have a lot of concerns about the city's money um, going to this private security firm and a lot a lot a lot of questions about which part of the budget this comes from and why we're doing it okay so uh, just a little bit of background the city did reply to uh, Andy um, and the decision to add the security firm was made through the city's emergency winter shelter and their extensions. So part of this, uh, 
there was ongoing security with the POV, and a lot of uh, neighbors, especially in that uh, particular area around the POV, were complaining about uh, people sleeping and defecating in alleyways and stuff like that, just very unsanitary. So security was used as a means to create a sense of safety, but at the same time, you know, they're fairly uh, armed and stuff. And also, I was just driving the other day past uh, Southgate Mall, and I was passing by the railroad park that they just built, and I noticed that there were uh, four uh, guys that would, that let, uh, okay, I, I'm, I mean, because this is just me prejudging an, a situation, but I did see a security guard approaching some of the fellows who were on a bench kind of chilling and hanging out, older guys. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, they, they, the, the whole idea of them being heavily armed is definitely uh, a, a thing. But one of the things is that the city has already put in a deal for the contract for money for this, uh, for the Rogers uh, security. So this is ongoing and it isn't necessarily a new thing, but it, it is interesting to kind of uh, delve into going back into uh, seeing something that's kind of been there for a while now, but people just don't necessarily know but notice it. And at the same time, like I've been driving by the POV in the last couple of months and I haven't noticed too much uh, uh, foot traffic just around on the outside and some tents, no tents are outside there as well. So I think in some ways it's doing its job, but, at, um, but on the other end, we've been, the city has been uh, fielding a lot of complaints um, beforehand as well. I'm assuming there's probably some more complaints about the homelessness in Missoula as well, but there's, the, I'm not gonna dive too much into it because it's not just a, um, uh, just like an issue with security and how it blends with our, with our, with our community, but also at the same time, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't want to go. And of course, going back to little school. The, so I'm just going to move on. OK, because it's, it's, it's such a big thing. And it's too big for me to talk about in this particular segment because I have a lot more to talk about with city council. And one of the things that uh, they're talking about is tearing down that wooden playground at Lowell School, which is a part of MCPS and uh, into a, a city agreement with the city of Missoula. And so they're going to be tearing that down or deconstructing it. And here's Heidi West talking a little bit more about this site. So for all of you that are tracking the progress over at the West Side Park, we're about to enter our next phase. Um, so there is going to be a volunteer day to deconstruct the existing playground. Um, it is going to be on April 2nd from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, because it's kind of a, a involved bit of the project. Uh, people need to sign up to volunteer ahead of time so that Sign up can be found at volunteermissoula.org if you just search for Westside Park Playground Deconstruction. Um, and you can sign up for a two hour shift um, to come help us prepare the site um, for the new playground that'll be built this summer. All right, so there's a lot of things happening um, moving forward in the city of Missoula, you know, Karis Park. Uh, all that construction happening there, the finishing of Higgins Bridge at some point. So there's just a lot of things moving. And, and after many years, the Missoula uh, co a community, the Westside Park, will be deconstructing the old wooden playground between this and Dragon's Hollow. Wooden playgrounds are too expensive to upkeep. They have to spend, uh, like, I think they spend upwards of a million dollars every a year or so uh, just to basically upkeep with the wood. I might be paraphrasing because it might be every five years, but then again, it's a like, very expensive endeavor to do like replacement and put some varnish on there because there's a lot of like when you're when you're working with wood uh, you have to deal with a lot of the elements and it, it was there's a cool video that was made about the construction of Dragon's Hollow and the Westside Park uh, wooden playground as well that I highly suggest you check out and it was part of a national campaign to build playgrounds in communities and we were able to get that back in the 90s so uh, that was kind of like the end of the city council meeting. We're going to move on to public works because we're diving into a deeper, um, talking a little bit more about a retrospect and informational about our public works um, and about the wa wastewater treatment facility, uh, the tree farm, and also the co city compost. And all these three, uh, the, uh, the, the smelly trinity in Missoula is known as a uh, resource recovery facility. And Gene Connell uh, talks about the Missoula's smelliest, but necessary utility. From that seven and a half million gallons of water uh, from the citizens of Missoula, we are able to recover uh, methane gas that we uh, use to generate electricity on site. Uh, the organic material and nutrients are removed and become part of Garden City compost. Uh, in the summertime, we pump uh, 1.2 million gallons a day uh, of treated water over to irrigate the poplars. So in that way, in the summertime, we're able to reduce our impact on the river even more. 
uh, by you know discharging you know six point three or whatever uh, million gallons a day rather than the seven and a half million gallons a day. So although we remove uh, organic material and nutrients, um, uh, it, it's not zero. Um, it, it, it's down to what the levels we're regulated for and that are considered safe to put into the river. But uh, by diverting that, uh, we uh, help the river even more. Yep. So, uh, you know, there's certain levels in which uh, all the water has to go through the wastewater treatment plant. And, you know, the, you can't do have a complete cleanliness, but the uh, poplar trees have been a good source for uh, uh, absorbing a lot of those uh, nitrogens and phosphorus and all that and all the uh, uh, chemicals that would be uh, very uh, would be put down through the river uh, and then we're utilizing for not only that but compost and also the tree farm that we have there and of course since tr uh, 1962 uh, waste runoff has been cut in half and by the next century the wastewater plant have been utilizing the energy collected from the waste to power the treatment facility making it near zero carbon emissions and the runoff after treatment goes to the poplar farms. Jean talks uh, about the energy the facility creates from the waste and this is... The cogen, what that means is we're generating electricity and we're also at the same time uh, collecting the heat. It's an internal combustion engine. Normally you'd have a radiator that would um, um, blow that heat off the atmosphere. Uh, but in this case we uh, use a heat exchanger to put it into our a hot water heat loop here at the plant. Uh, so the system is um, in the mid 90s, 90% 90 efficient. It's yeah, like 95%, I think, uh, efficient system. And what that means is that the system uh, powers itself and it's kind of like its own operation and they've created it in a way where it's very much like it just does it for us. So uh, there, are, uh, there, there are also looking for to get solar panels installed on site as well and they'll be using a third party to purchase and install to be able to take advantage of the tax breaks which incentivizes private enterprises and not necessarily government entities. And this is kind of what the uh, county did when they put the uh, Montana's largest state solar array on the Missoula County Detention Center. Um, so one of the things, uh, and then of course moving on from the wastewater treatment plant, there's a lot it does, but we're going to be talking about the compost. So Gene talks a, bit, a little bit more about the um, utilizing some of the thicker waste that cannot be discharged back into the river. Missoula is very lucky to um, be able to use this product. In 1977, it started up as a private company, uh, and uh, we paid Eco Compost uh, to to process our biosolids. Um, this is our least expensive disposal option. It would cost uh, more money to landfill it, uh, not to mention, in my eyes, being inefficient. This is our least expensive uh, disposal option. All right. So, uh, yeah, like he said, like, you know, otherwise a lot of this stuff would just end up going to the landfill. And it, and it seems like the wastewater treatment plant have been really good about reutilizing a lot of this stuff. Not to mention, a Missoula compost is a great tool for people to utilize for landscaping. This is one of the better places to take your grass cuttings and other vegetation that would otherwise go into the landfill. I feel like I'm doing a commercial for the Missoula compost, but it's nothing is more commercial than what the pl city plans to do with the poplar trees when they are ready to be harvested. And this is what uh, the poplar trees and just a little bit of retrospective about uh, the reasoning behind it. So the poplar plantation uh, was planted in uh, 2014 on that leased land. Um, oh, you can't see very well. This was construction in 2014. Um, this might be a little better picture. You can see the drip irrigation lines being laid out. Uh, it was planted that year. So at the end of the season, you see that the leaves are changing color a little bit in the fall of 2015, uh, the end of the second season. Uh, it's amazing how these things grow. Okay, so yeah, there's just a lot of uh, great uh, things that have been used with the trees, but unfortunately, in terms of the poplar hybrids, um, uh, da, da, da. These are uh, the poplar hybrids, and much like the presentation uh, presented, kind of shows the recycling of our waste through the treatment plant to the compost and then to the trees in the plantation. So it's very symmetrical. But Gene also talks about the unfortunate nature of selling the wood from these trees and that we may not be able to have uh, the kind of uh, resale value that we originally thought we did. And so, you know, the market that existed when this project was planned, uh, we found it no longer exists. And there are poplar plantations in Oregon 
um, that have since uh, sold the land, cut down the trees, uh, and the sawmill associated with it shut down. Uh, that uh, market just did not develop. And so um, here we are. Market forces have changed. We need to adapt. Uh, Missoula Public Works is now directly managing the project. Uh, in the past, uh, we had uh, uh, a contractor managing the trees. Um, we brought in Anderson Montgomery Engineering to do uh, uh, an analysis of alternatives. So where, where do we go from here? So there are many alternatives that Gene also looked into in terms of this during this presentation. And he talks, uh, you know, uh, regardless of what these trees are worth, the main point of these trees was to divert waste from the river, reducing the nitrogen by 11,000 pounds and phosphorus by 500 pounds annually. Uh, so they may not, uh, not plant poplar trees in the future, but they may be taking a swing on other vegetation. And a lot of this waste and uh, recycling has been very uh, beneficial to the land that has been the city has been leasing for these tree farms. So there's potential for future, but um, in terms of those wood, we just don't have the kind of uh, uh, the m it would be it would be a way it would waste more money to have the wood delivered and taken somewhere to be processed and used. Um, and that's just this is the nature of our. Uh, just in the world today is that there's just not much need for a lot of lumber mills that are you know or manufacturing it seems like we're importing f not even from america anymore but i don't want to go into that too much because <laughs> yeah it's 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 very kind of it's it's pretty sad when you think about it in terms of that but uh so so they may not plant poplar trees in the future but they do are taking another the swing at other vegetation so uh during this presentation gene is talking about uh potential ideas in which they can plant there for the future so one possibility we looked at would be to harvest the trees on about a three-year rotation, uh, chip them as a feedstock for the composting facility. Uh, the trees would be allowed to coppice and come up in a brushy configuration, and then we would harvest, go back in three years and harvest that brush. So it would be an ongoing thing. This was kind of my favorite option. I, I really liked the, um, I don't know, the symmetry of it. Um, another thing we looked at is alfalfa, and we looked at growing hemp, uh, Christmas trees, uh, sod, and combined alfalfa and sod. One of their biggest goals is that they want to figure out a way that is sustainable, but also something that can be done o over year after year without costing more than it's uh, that they make and not making too like they just want to make something that's sustainable that will also be continuing the natural um, wastewater treatment of the river. So that kind of concludes my city council report. I do have a clip for you guys from an interview. I'm, I'm running out of time and I've had a lot of long clips, but I wanted to throw this interview out there featuring Tiffany Williams from 406 Families. And they're talking about a bunch of summer camps and tis the season to uh, book out your summer for your kids. And here's the interview where you can find out more information about your summer camps and more and a little tease for Mars. Hey guys, I'm here with Tiffany Williams and she is the content editor for 406 Families. Uh, that website is 406families.org. And uh, their main goal has been to kind of create a blog or a central source of information to spread the word about summer camps, uh, one of my favorite things, food trucks, <laughs> um, and of various other things that are very family uh, driven. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your website. Well, we started it because we knew that there wasn't um, one central location for all sorts of information about resources for families or people raising kids. And so whether that means, you know, you're here in Missoula and you're visiting and you just are looking for some different parks to take your kids to, or whether that means, you know, you're a parent who's looking for summer camps, we have lots of great resources for that on our website, 406families.org. And we've recently released um, our summer camp guide, which has been a really big deal. We have uh, more than 50 camps listed on our summer camp guide. And that's just a great place for parents to go to find out, you know, if your kid's really into insects, what kinds of camps can they go to, or if they really like horses, or if they're really into sports. And so um, we have you guys on there. We're really excited yep. about some of the camps that you're offering and yeah. uh, lots of different things for kids to do around Missoula this summer. Yep, so tell us about some of the, uh, the feedback from this website. Yeah, it's been really great. So we um, have, have enjoyed being able to have a conversation with our community about um, some different like topics or issues that parents really 
have to think about or worry about as they're raising kids. Um, one, you know, really recent topic that we've had a lot of people ask us questions about are just how do I talk to my kids about Ukraine? Like, how do I talk to my kids about war? How do I introduce this, you know, horrific thing that's happening in the world to my kids in a way that's not going to scare them? And so we wrote an article about that. We've had a lot of articles about, you know, um, uh, hot button issues like various protests or things like that and kind of navigating those hard topics with kids. But then we've also just had some really fun, light, you know, uh, articles about like what new food trucks are coming this summer or, you know, what different um, coffee shops are really kid friendly and, and things like that. And so it's been a good way to really just help parents in our community navigate parenting. We have a lot of issues that are, you know, really just um, maybe parent related, like, you know, if there's a, a mom who's struggling with, um, her body image, you know, how do we present that yeah. to the world in a way that doesn't change the way that uh, the young girls think about their bodies or yeah. things like that? So yeah, body body positivity is is, uh, is very key in this as well. But at the same time, um, the approach can be very. You also have to watch the approach too, because yeah. it's like we're celebrating your body. It's just like please don't, because <laughs> it's like kind of like that mindset. Just like yeah, I yeah I get it. Just yeah, that's not what it's about. But. So four or six families, a great source for information regarding summer camps. And I know that a lot of uh, mothers out there, especially my sister, is like basically mapping out her kid's summer. Yeah, summer in Montana is just like a different beast. And so we've talked to parents who have had, you know, uh, seven tabs open on their computer and three calendars and they have their bank account open and they have a spreadsheet and they're just trying to figure out how to make everything yeah. fit. So we wanted to make that process easier. And we released a summer camp guide that's um, just very inclusive of everything going on, but then we also have um, certain camps highlighted. So that's yeah, yeah. and um, it's, it's also a great resource because you know some parents always have like, oh, I was a Y uh, M C A kid, so my kids are going to be Y M C A kids. But this gives them another grasp to uh, uh, attach onto and be like, oh, so there's other camps at these other facilities, other things happening on here. Oh, I've never taken a pottery class. That'd be cool for the kid. Oh, a cooking class for a kid. Maybe the kid could cook for me for once. That kind of <laughs> thing. Just kind of like the mindset of just kind of. Like, finding a, a source of information, and I think this is a really good uh, resource for a lot of people in our community. Yeah, we hope so. Thank you so much for saying that because we put a lot of work into it. I mean, just so many hours trying to consolidate everything, but uh, I think that, you know, summer camps are such a great way, like you were just saying, to expose children and sometimes entire families to, you know, new types of art or new sports or whatever. And so I was talking to a dad this morning who, you know, just basically said, like, uh, my son's five and I'm new to all of this. Just help me out, you know. Yeah. So um, it is a good it's a good way to help people wrap their minds around it. But I would encourage families to, you know, try new things. If you oh, yeah. always did soccer, you know, maybe give your kids the opportunity to try wrestling or, or something like that. So Yeah, and it's always uh, – and also it could be used as a kind of uh, a way for a parent to be like, well, you know, I, want, I did soccer. I love soccer. My kid doesn't like soccer. It's like – well, let's just have you in soccer for this week, and then maybe you can do that uh, one art camp that you wanted to do. Maybe kind of mix it up rather than just having one kid with one mindset. It's nice to have that kind of uh, uh, experiential diversity in a way. Right, yeah. If you do it right, you can end the summer with a very well-rounded child who has done <laughs> theater and art <laughs> and sports and all sorts of different experiences. Awesome. And so another uh, cool thing about Four or Six Families, it's uh, it's basically a, an amalgamation of mothers coming together to create a blog spot for other mothers in Missoula. Yeah, it's um, it's really great. It, there's three of us, and we have a lot of contributing writers as well. Um, but I think that the age groups between all three of us are nine to thirteen. No, sorry, one to thirteen, and there's nine children involved. So. We've got kind of all the age groups covered. Nice. <laughs> well, uh, let's uh, tell the folks uh, where they can find more information about you guys. Sure. So we're at 406families.org, or if you're on social media, look for 406 Families Missoula. And um, we publish new content uh, three or four times a week, so we look forward to seeing you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> you heard of Spring Flicks? This is the Media Camp. You can make movies. Hey, don't hang up. This is a media camp. Spring Flicks, this March 21st through the 25th. While spring break lets your kids out, you can drop them off here at MCAT. From 10 to 3, your kid gets to use many of our resources to create and share their own stories. For kids age 8 to 14, a fun break from their spring break. Spring Flicks. Spring Flicks.